From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. We start in Ecuador, where worker unions and social organizations have taken to the streets of Quito to stand against recent hikes in the price of fuel. We have more on this report. <laughs> Workers' union and several social organizations marched peacefully in Quito against the increase of the price of gas in Ecuador. Finance Minister Richard Martinez announced the price of regular gas, as well as that of Ecopais, which is a type of ethanol-derived gas will increase from $1.48 to $1.85 per gallon. This has created an uproar in various areas of the country. This is a neoliberal onset. It is a return of neoliberalism to Ecuador. This already happened in Argentina with the government of Mauricio Macri and in France with the government of Emmanuel Macron. These are outdated policies that already failed in other countries. This is why social organizations are once again taken to the streets to say to Lenin Moreno's government that our resistance starts now. We have given an economic proposal that says no to oil intervention. We need to reduce the value-added tax from 12% to 10% for there to be an economic recovery. We must not forgive business people's debts and we must get back to what was stolen so that Ecuadorians don't have to pay these consequences. Purchasing power has decreased. The price of gasoline is going up. There will be an economic crisis and inflation. So that is what we are rejecting. This is the second demonstration after Minister Martinez made the announcement on the new price of fuel. In most gas stations in the country, premium gasoline has gone up in price from $2.98 to $3.10 per gallon. Before this change, the government had expressed that the price of premium gas would be regulated according to its market value. Our union is taking its first action against the measures implemented by President Moreno and his ministers, against economic measures that have raised the price of gasoline and greatly affected the economy. It is unbelievable that they are putting their hands inside the pockets of our people to solve a crisis that hasn't been created by us. The demonstration went past the streets of the historical center in Quito and ended outside the presidential palace. However, as has occurred in the last demonstrations against the economic adjustments, police blocked the entry to the palace. This affects us all. The fact that they say that gas prices will increase, that will raise the price of everything. That's why we have to take to the streets and protest so they know that people are affected by these economic measures. Workers' organizations have announced they will continue protesting against price increases and the economic measures of the government. They demand that the president work for citizens' interests and provide the necessary systems so that there is no price speculation of other basic goods, which would directly affect Ecuadorian families. A key witness in the corruption investigation of the Odebrecht scandal has been found dead in Colombia. The body of Rafael Merchan, the former government's secretary for transparency, was found in his apartment. According to authorities, Merchan had been missing since Tuesday and had previously received death threats. Merchan was to testify in the case of Luis Fernando Andrade, the former director of infrastructure, over allegations that bribes were paid to the Brazilian company to secure a highway contract. This is the third exchange death in Colombia linked to the Odebrecht scandal, following the former auditor of the contract and his son, who were found dead last month. A protest in Chile demanding justice for the killing of a Mapuche man by the National Police turned violent on Thursday. Fighting between protesters and police broke out in Santiago as one officer was left unconscious. Water cannons and tear gas were used and several people were arrested. The protest was the latest in a series of rallies following the killing of Camilo Catrillanca last month. On Monday, Mapuche leaders called on the president to demand the resignation of the interior minister, Andres Chadwick, over the murder. Indigenous leader Milagro Sala has been acquitted in a case in which she was accused of attempted murder. 
Prosecutors in Argentina had initially requested she be sentenced to 12 years in prison. Sala, who has been referred to as President Mauricio Macri's political prisoner, was accused of hiring someone to kill another social leader in the province of Jujuy. But the court agreed that there is no evidence linking Sala to the case. Sala has been detained since 2016 on a number of charges, including fraud and embezzlement. She denies all charges and has accused Macri of persecuting her. Today I was acquitted in the shooting case, one of the many lawsuits I have been involved in. Various judges wanted to pressure me with various lawsuits, but today it was proven that everything that I am going through is political and judicial persecution. It has been demonstrated that I had nothing to do in this case and that I insist this is political persecution. I want to thank you and this is a glimmer of hope that we can still believe in justice. Thank you. Women's issues have also gained momentum this year in Argentina. We were joined by Angelica Peñas de Fago, a social scientist and member of the Catholics for the Right to Choose. We asked her how the struggle for free, safe and legal abortion can coexist with the stance of the Catholic Church on this topic. We support the demand for the separation between the state and the church. Uh, and we didn't think as Catholica of a Catholic person, this is a contradiction because in fact, we believe and we support the personal belief, but we are talking about the institutional rules, the institutional role of the state, the state sorry, uh, regarding the, re the relationship with some religions. And we support this separation uh, because we really need in Latin America and because the colonial heritage and the decades or maybe century of heritage of this political, religious scope that translate differently to civil and political policies and, and this political uh, uh, alliance between the state and our churches affect differently the women and LGBT, LGBT rights person rights. The latest wage negotiations in Uruguay have been positive for both the government and workers. However, the private sector was left feeling disappointed. Let's find out more about the latest developments. This year's negotiations were unprecedented as more than a million workers and nearly 150,000 Uruguayan companies participated. According to the Minister of Labour and Social Affairs, Ernesto Moro, collective bargaining has never been stronger. More than 88% of agreements are between workers and entrepreneurs. This for us is very positive because it shows the importance of collective bargaining. Half of the agreements involve three parties. Out of 198 groups that negotiated labor conditions, 98% reached an agreement. In 88% of cases, workers and their employers managed to negotiate better conditions, with the government intervening in seven cases. Secretary of the Workers' Centre, Gabriel Molina, said negotiations were successful. From our point of view, the outcome of the salary councils was very positive. It was hard work, as we had to struggle for what we want. There were some weakness in negotiating by the government. On the other hand, the businessmen were ruthless as they wanted to push the deregulation which they believe is the international standard. It's already been proposed in Brazil and total deregulation exists in Argentina with President Mauricio Macri in power. There are still four groups that haven't finished negotiations and they are expected to reach an agreement soon. The police officers who are establishing areas of negotiation are missing ranging from improvements at the labor label and the salary. The Board of Entities is also negotiating wage councils, and I cannot remember well, but two or three private unions are missing. In addition to achieving salary increases, the agreements include improvements in other labor rights, such as training of workers, care services and daycare and family benefits. Paraguay is set to inaugurate the first green route of South America in 2019. 
This electric vehicle route is planned to be a thousand kilometers long and will connect the country's main cities with the capital Asuncion. Electric cars will be charged in less than 20 minutes in stations all across the highway. Paraguay is also seeking to start a similar initiative with public transportation. At least eight people were killed and more than two dozens injured when a bus plunged down a ravine in Peru. Peruvian media reported the bus was carrying around 55 passengers as it was heading to Lima. Emergency response teams arrived to the scene to pull bodies from the vehicle and rush survivors to a nearby hospital. A group of shamans in Peru say they might have found the key for world peace. Shamans dressed in their traditional attire perform various rituals. They had pictures of U.S. President Donald Trump, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The ritual including hitting their portraits with flowers, chanting over them, and dunking them in the sea. The shamans say they want to bring positive energy and peace to the whole world. As for the work, we have done with the shamans. We met to predict good things for 2019. We have seen political. There are issues with presidents Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, and Kim Jong-un. We've seen a little tension, but in 2019, that will decrease. We did a ritual on the coast, the mountain, and the jungle. Shamans use our strength and energy. Under the sun and the sea, we gave payment to the earth so that it may give strength and energy to the whole world. We want peace and tranquility. We don't want wars. We ask nature to calm down, because nature is reclaiming its own land with volcanoes, and more volcanoes will emerge. More stories coming up. We'll be back. Welcome back. Two women have died in Jamaica after a boat carrying over a dozen passengers capsized. The victims have not yet been identified. Eleven passengers were rescued safely off the coast of Kingston and have been transferred to a local hospital. Authorities say they responded immediately to the distress call made by the boat and were able to rescue the rest of the passengers. The accident happened between Port Royal and Lam Cay. The government of Jamaica is considering imposing fines of up to 1 million Jamaican dollars for violating the country's plastic ban. The ban on single-use plastics will take effect on January 1st. It's part of a state strategy to reduce the impact plastic is having on the environment. The Ministry of Economic Growth is still debating ways to uphold the ban. Dominica's government is set to start construction on a geothermal energy plant in 2019. The plant will help bring clean and low-cost renewable energy to around 23,000 homes, according to the government. The project is expected to be completed in 18 months. So far, the government has invested 18 million U.S. dollars in the plant to be built in the Rousseau Valley. It will be a major boost to the Caribbean island, which aims to be the world's first climate-resilient country. The Christmas season is being celebrated with a unique blend of carnival festivities in the Caribbean island of St. Kitts and Nevis. It's the country's biggest event of the year, also known as Sugar Mass. Traditional mass characters fill the streets during Juve celebrations. The spectacle of Sugar Mass Carnival takes over the island each year between Christmas and New Year's. And the Caribbean has lost one of its most distinguished legal luminaries, Sir Fenton Ramsahoy, has passed away. The Queen's counsel and former Attorney General of Guyana died in Barbados of natural causes. He was 89. Sir Fenton enjoyed a legal career throughout the Caribbean that spanned six decades. 
He holds the record among attorneys in the English-speaking Caribbean as having made the most appearances in the Judicial Committee of the London-based Privy Council. He was also at the forefront of the independence movement in Guyana. The government of Sudan has confirmed that at least 19 people have been killed during protests against the increase of the price of bread. Those killed include 17 civilians and two members of the security forces. Meanwhile, civil society activists claim that nine opposition leaders, including Sidiq Youssef, a senior leader of the Communist Party of Sudan, have been arrested by the government. They believe the arrests are part of an effort to stop new waves of protests expected after Friday prayers. In the northern state, there were three deaths. In the state of the Nile River, five deaths. And in the state of Gadarif, six deaths. In the White Nile region, there were three more deaths. Among those who died during the protest, two were members of the security forces. People in Madagascar have received Andri Rajuelina's recent victory in the country's run of elections with mixed feelings. I love him because he's young and he didn't really have a chance to exercise his power well during the transition. However, he was able to achieve a lot as president of the transition and that was good. The two candidates can say what they want. I would have really liked to have had another person in power, a new face, someone different. And with less than 48 hours to go before the presidential elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a new poll is pointed to a victory for the opposition. The opinion poll by New York-based Congo Research Group revealed that 44% of voters intend to vote for the Lamuka coalition candidate Martin Fayulu. This puts him ahead of former front-runner Feli Shisekedi and the ruling party's Emmanuel Shadari. We're taking one last break. Stay with us. Actions have an impact on the environment. It's our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve, and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. With developing events being presented through analysis, our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Salud amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y pongo ustedes las cámaras, señor director. And we're back. The Syrian army has entered the Kurdish-held city of Manbij, located close to the border with Turkey. The army said they responded to calls made to guarantee security of the city's residents. Based on the army and the armed forces' total commitment to its role in implementing sovereignty on every inch of the Syrian Arab Republic, and in response to the calls of the people of Manbij, the armed forces announced that members of the Syrian Arab Army have entered Manbij and have raised the flag of the Syrian Arab Republic in it. 
An Israeli human rights group has revealed that authorities have approved the construction of hundreds of Jewish-only settlements in occupied East Jerusalem. According to Peace Now, Israeli authorities have given the go-ahead for the construction of 2,191 new units in East Jerusalem's Jivat Sif settlement. International law regards both the West Bank and East Jerusalem as occupied territories and considers the building of settlements in these areas by Israel as illegal. Hundreds of people in Jordan have braved the heavy rains to protest against austerity measures backed by the International Monetary Fund. The youth-led movement has been demonstrating in Amman for over a month. They are seeking, they are asking for political and economic reforms against corruption and have spoken out against Prime Minister Omar Razas, who was appointed to pass new fiscal measures to reduce the deficit. Authorities in Bangladesh have severely restricted internet services ahead of Sunday's elections. The government says this is an attempt to fight the spread of propaganda by political parties. The run-up to the election has been marked by deadly violence. Opposition party BNP has accused the ruling alliance of arresting thousands of their party members. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina from the Awami League party is seeking a third term in office. You see, when the internet is down, we can't use the internet calling apps. It can't attend calls from overseas. This is very problematic for all of us. People like us who are offering ride-sharing services face a lot of difficulties if there is no internet. Like we don't get enough calls, the rain comes wrong and we face many other difficulties. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has traveled to Brazil to attend the inauguration of incoming President Jair Bolsonaro. This is the first trip by an Israeli premier to Brazil. Netanyahu will also hold talks with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on the sidelines of the event on January 1st. The Israeli Prime Minister is expected to discuss with Bolsonaro the moving of the Brazilian embassy in his country to Jerusalem. The partial government shutdown in the United States will continue into next year. It was caused by a deadlock over President Donald Trump's proposal to build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. Trump has insisted that taxpayers should pay the $5 billion required to build the wall. His proposal was opposed by Democrats and some Republicans leading to the shutdown. I hope it doesn't take weeks. Uh, it's been far too long for the government worker. But to date, I do not know uh, whether the uh, distinguished uh, colleagues across the aisle, my friends, uh, have come to any number that the president can sign and what he feels very strongly about in terms of border security. Now let us have a look at more stories from around the world. The Chinese government has announced that it will expand environmental inspections of state-owned enterprises. The program is part of an effort to combat high levels of pollution that the world's second largest economy is grappling with. A report by the Kenyan Wildlife Service indicates that elephant poaching in the country has gone down by over 50 percent. The report says 40 elephants were poached in 2018 compared to 80 in 2017. In recent years, the government of Kenya has stepped up measures to reduce rampant poaching inside its national parks. Australia's post-Christmas heat wave continues to sweep across the country, with a near record-breaking for 9 degrees Celsius being focused for Western Australia. The country's weather bureau has issued fire, health and air quality warnings across the nation. To cool off, citizens both young and old have taken to the country's beaches. Well, definitely I go to the highest sun protection what I can find. Usually uh, I take 50 plus, but today I have something around 80, like pretty high. And I have two bottles of water with me, like I try to drink three liters at least now in one hour. A ship carrying over 300 migrants who were rescued by humanitarian organization Open Arms has arrived in Spain. The government authorized the ship to dock after denials by both Malta and Italy resulted in migrants spending their Christmas on the chilly waters of the Mediterranean. Thousands of migrants hoping to reach Europe to escape poverty and war have died while trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. And that brings us to the end of this news brief for this and other stories. You can read them from our website at telesurenglish.net. 
And we are also on social media, so go ahead and follow us. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.